so the title is No, I Wasn't Arrested After All, uh, Culture, Intelligence, and Education. Um, so, uh, you know, what, what sort of motivated this for me uh, was some experiences I had, and these were in England, which is about as similar culturally as you can get if you go to another country. Uh, the first experience was uh, when I was in the tube, as they call it, as the subway I would call it, uh, and I saw a sign that said, uh, no busking allowed. Uh, this was some years ago, and uh, I at the time did not know what busking was. And as I walked through the station, the more I thought about it, the more I was afraid I might be busking. Uh, and I wasn't aware of busking, but it just felt like, uh, I, I don't know, I felt like a busker. And um, I found myself wanting to get out of the station, uh, which I did uh, as quickly as I could. I later found out that busking is like playing an instrument for money, which I wasn't in fact doing, n no kind of instrument at all. Uh, but. Uh, I realized that the vocabulary in uh, London was different from what I was used to. Uh, and then on a separate trip, I, I did what a lot of Americans do when they cross the street. You, you know that the cars and buses come from the other side, but I looked the wrong way anyway. Uh, you know, it was just kind of instinctive and almost got run over by a bus. Uh, and, you know, in a way, the ultimate form of non-adaptation is death, right? I mean, because if you're trying to adapt and you're run over by a bus, I, I think that that's a good operational test of non-adaptation. And what occurred to me is that the skills you need for adaptation, even in a really similar culture like that in England, are different from those you need here. And if they're different in a similar culture, uh, how different might they be in places that are more different than England? So uh, the work I'm going to be talking about is work I've done over the years with collaborators from many countries. Uh, most of the cultural work was funded by the Partnership for Child Development, which was based out of Oxford uh, for most of its time, uh, Imperial College for the rest of its time, and some of the work was funded by the College Board and by private donors. So that's just uh, an acknowledgment. But there are many partners in this research, and so I just want to make sure that I mention uh, the many, you know, there's a long list of people, and I just uh, am grateful to them. So I'll be doing a sort of introduction, and then I'll talk about some cultural studies, and then I'll talk about a particular application to the United States, and then I'll draw some conclusions, and then it'll be five o'clock, and so we'll end. What's so funny? <laughs> One of the things I learned when I give talks is I locked the doors from the outside because I really get upset when people leave. So it, I, I guarantee at 5 o'clock you'll be out of here uh, and my plane will have left so everyone will be happy. So let's start with the introduction. Oops, I missed one. No, that's not. Okay, so let's see. All right, now. Go. There. Okay, so the, the general mission and a lot of the work I've done over the years has been to understand how to develop and assess abilities, competencies, and expertise, and especially how can you understand and help people to transform abilities into competencies and competencies into expertise. How can you make them better at what they do? So that's been sort of one aspect of it, and it's uh, trying to show that abilities are not fixed, they're modifiable. And to people here, that may sound like an obvious statement, but many uh, psychologists and others in my field uh, feel that abilities are rather fixed. Uh, and that although you can make small differences, basically you're born with a genetic predisposition and you can't do much about it. Okay, so almost all parents want their kids to be smart, right? I mean, you don't want to have stupid kids. So most parents want their kids to be smart if you want them to be stupid. Um, but getting smart means different things in different <coughs> cultures and even different subcultures and even within a country. It can be different. So what I'll be arguing today is that intelligence and related constructs have to be understood and measured and developed in their cultural context and that education and society need to take those contexts into account. So that's sort of the general overview of the main message. That, so that's different from the message of many psychologists who would say, oh, what are you talking about? We have IQ tests and we give IQ tests and you can translate them uh, and then they'll be okay. Or 
you know, we have SATs and ACTs and we can just give the SAT or the ACT or some statewide mastery test and that that test will tell you the same thing for everybody. Uh, and if it doesn't tell you quite the same thing, it still will tell you how prepared they are for a given program. So although uh, we'd like to think that people realize there is some ecological difference in people brought up in different cultures, the way we test in this country is very much not based on that model. It's based on there's one set of tests they're used for everybody, they're interpreted more or less the same way for everybody. So uh, I have this picture. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is a place, it's a, it was a school, a part of a school in Tanzania where we did some of our research and while we were doing the research the building collapsed. Uh, and I put this picture in just to make the point that you know, here when we do testing, we're used to, you know, is there a little bit of noise in the room that might have lowered scores? Or was it a little too warm or a little too hot? Uh, so we're used to sort of what we might call minor variants of the testing environment, but when you do cultural studies around the world, you, you're dealing with bigger issues in terms of the context of testing, like the building uh, falling down while, while you're doing the testing, and that's what happened here. Uh, so a lot of my work has been motivated by what I call the theory of successful intelligence and that's the motivation for the work I'm going to be talking about for the next four hours or five hours. Um, uh, successful intelligence is the ability to succeed in life within what one's cultural context. So it's not your IQ or your SAT score. It's how well can you succeed within the context in which you live. And so that means that your successful intelligence here might be different from what it might be in Tanzania or Russia or China, or it might even be different from what it would be if you were to select a different job trajectory, or uh, from what it would be if you lived in a different state uh, or city. So it's your ability to succeed in life within your cultural context by capitalizing on strengths and compensating for correcting weaknesses, which means that nobody's good at everything. Uh, this, uh, the, the theory of general intelligence notwithstanding, and that theory says that, you know, G is if you're good at one thing, you tend to be good at lots of things. And if you're not good at one thing, you tend to be bad at lots of things. And this view is that really nobody's good at everything, even people who are high in G. And uh, people who are successful figure out what they do well. and although our levels of G here may not be all that variable, general intelligence, um, our strengths and weaknesses are different. And I talked about that with people this morning. Some people publish more articles. Some people publish fewer articles. Uh, some people go for, uh, you know, have a style of research that they sort of emphasize doing empirical stuff in a laboratory. Some people are more ecologically oriented and maybe go outside, but people have different strengths and weaknesses and you have to figure out who you are, what you do well, and make the most of that. And the things you don't do so well, you either compensate or correct. You know, so I'm not a details person, say, so I need people around me who look at the details. Someone else may be a detail person, needs people around them who more deals with the general things. Through adapting to, shaping, and selecting environments, part of the time you change yourself to fit the environment. Part of the time you try to change the environment to fit you. So you come to graduate school here, a lot of you look like graduate students. Part of it is you adapt to, hey, this is different from my undergraduate school, how can I make myself fit in? Part of it is there are things about the environment I really wish could be better, can I change the environment some to make them better? And I, you know, or for example, you might decide, well, maybe it would help to think about how psychology and human development could combine in some way and maybe some other units and or so that the whole would be greater than the sum of the parts. So you're shaping the environment. And sometimes you select environments. You say, I'm, I'm just in the wrong place, I'm gonna leave, which is what I'm doing right now in my life. Uh, and that will be the topic of my midnight lecture uh, tonight. <laughs> Uh, it, it will be in here, and if I'm a little late, wait. Uh, <laughs> and you do that by a combination of analytical, creative, practical, and wisdom-based ethical skills. You need creative uh, skills and attitudes to come up with new ideas. You need analytical skills and attitudes to say whether they're good ideas. You need practical skills and attitudes to 
put your ideas into practice and to convince others that they're worth anything. And you need wisdom-based skills and ethical skills to make sure that they're for common good. So when you give a talk like this, your job talk or your you know, colloquium or whatever it is, the creative part is you haven't come up with the ideas, right? That you don't want, oh, you know, I've heard that uh, from 20 other people, so it's not very creative. So part of it is creative and part of it is analytical that you need some data to support your ideas, that it's not just a bunch of hot air. And partly you need the practical skills to be able to communicate the ideas in a way that people understand and to persuade them to listen to you rather than, you know, in my case, the evil people uh, who disagree and have false and ungodly ideas. And partly you need, uh, I, I was only kidding, uh, uh, no I wasn't, uh, and part of it uh, is that you need wisdom-based skills and ask, is, you know, am, am I somehow achieving some kind of common good here? Is, the, is what I'm suggesting going to help society or hurt it? Okay, and the general framework in which this kind of work that I'm talking about today is a bioecological one, uh, which basically uh, comes out of this place. Uh, people like Steve C.C. and Yuri Braun from Brenner. Uh, it's really the tradition uh, within the field of intelligence that suggests a given task may have a different meaning and be performed in a different way as a function of the interaction between biology and the ecology of the individual. So if you were to take Steve's cupcake study or Braun von Brenner's general ecological framework, you realize that giving, say, an SAT or an IQ test, it can mean different things for different people in different places. So that's the general framework that we're working in here. And uh, I've sometimes said that, in, at least in my field, but it would really apply in any field, you can sort of think about four different models. And by far the most common one in my field is what I call uh, very creatively and interestingly a model one. Uh, and, uh, and that is uh, that I intelligence is basically the same thing every place. You know, if you want to test intelligence here, you do it in English. If you want to test it in um, France, you do it in French. And if you want to test it in Indonesia, you do it in Indonesia. So you translate the test. But uh, the overwhelming majority of studies, they translate to tests. So you have the same tests, and intelligence, you're saying, are th is the same thing. So the Herrnstein and Murray kind of approach, Arthur Jensen and many, the large majority of people in this field, is that it's the same thing everywhere, and the tests are the same. So if you want to do a cross-cultural study of intelligence, you'd, prefer, you'd say compare WISC scores in different cultures, uh, translating the test. So that would be model one, which is sort of the going model in cross-cultural psychology. Uh, a second model, which would be more consistent with the work of Dick Nisbet, say, would be you use the same tests, uh, translated, but the same tests might involve different processes uh, and different structures. So uh, a person from Asia might see the same stimuli in a different way, say put more emphasis on, the, more focus on the background uh, the, what you would see as the, uh, the background, and they might see that as the foreground, and what you see as the foreground, they might see as the background. So it, it's the same task, but they're seeing it in a different way. They're perceiving it, that very task differently. The third model, which is the one I tend to use, is that there is some common core of intelligence everywhere. So everywhere you go, you have to recognize when you have problems, Right? You know, like, uh, things aren't going well with my spouse, they're not going well with my job, they're not well, going well with my kids, they're not going well with my health, otherwise I'm fine. So you have to recognize problems. You have to define what they are. You know, what the heck's matter with my marriage or with my job or with my health. Uh, after you define what they are, you have to sort of mentally represent them and then you have to allocate resources to the solution of the problem. And then you have to set up a strategy for solving the problem. And then you have to go ahead and solve the problem, and then you have to monitor your solution, and then you have to evaluate the solution after you're done. That you have to do everywhere. But, I've argued, and in some of the conversations I've had today, the tests that you would use, like a wisdom that we were talking about, would differ as a function of context or the age of the person or whatever. And then model four, which is sort of the extreme other end from model one, uh, which would be John Barry's model, is that I everything is pretty relative. The, um, 
it, the structures and processes of intelligence are different and the tests are different. That nothing works everywhere. That, you know, every place you go, you have to sort of start over. So those are, you get the extremes. The extreme is either everything's the same, everything's different, or two intermediate positions. Okay, so there have been some studies, and I'm not going to say a lot about them, but what, what I think they showed pretty well is that, you know, I intelligence can sort of have different implications, different places. Like the Nunez studies of street kids in Brazil show that in one context on the street, kids could do mathematical operations, but if you gave them the same thing uh, in another context in a the classroom, they can't solve the problems. So that suggests that what would seem to be a, a test depends on the context in which it's given. Uh, Jean Lave did studies of housewives in Berkeley, and she showed, well, you get the, it's not only Brazilian street kids, that you can get the same phenomenon uh, in Berkeley, California, that math problems that essentially housewives can solve in the supermarket of comparing prices they can't solve when they're giving the problems in a sort of abstract context. Uh, and you all know, I think the C.C. Brown from Brenner's study of time monitoring while baking cupcakes depends where you're doing the baking, how you're going to monitor your time. So, so there is some empirical background for what I'm going to be talking about today. So uh, let's get to some of these cultural studies. And the first one I'll talk about is that students may develop contextually important skills at the expense of academic ones. So we tend to think that you know, if we want to measure intelligence, we give an SAT or an IQ test, or we could even give some kind of statewide mastery test, which is an indirect measure of intelligence. Uh, and uh, so, some time ago, I was talking to Kate Noakes as a parasitologist who used to be at Oxford, and she said that there are these kids in Kenya who would know the names of 80 or 90 or 100 natural herbal medicines that could be used to combat parasitic illnesses. And I said, well, that's interesting. Um, you know, our kids wouldn't know any of those. I wonder how they do on IQ tests. Uh, so I said, well, well, let's find out. So we did that. So we did studies uh, around Kisumu in Kenya, which is here, not in Kisumu, sort of small villages around Kis Kisumu, um, with kids from these rural villages. Uh, they're little, little kids, and this is a school, so it's a little different from the kind of school that we would be used to. Uh, and these are the kids, and these are sort of some of the kinds of kids we were working with. And the question was, so what, the big question was, what is the relationship of practical intelligence as measured by tacit knowledge of natural herbal medicines to academic intelligence and academic achievement? Let me just explain that question. So what the hell is that about? Well, let's say if you live here, there's not much value in knowing a lot about natural or medicines to combat parasitic illnesses. I mean, it's just not helpful to know. But if you're a kid growing up in Kenya, where things like malaria, schistosomiasis, uh, whipworm, hookworm are major challenges you face in your life, and when you get ill with those, you're home from school and you're getting behind in school and you can't really do your chores, for some people, that, for those kids, that's probably the biggest problem they face in their lives. Just as if you have cancer, you can, you can either work on writing papers or you can sort of work on treating your cancer, right? When you're ill, you have to put the illnesses first if you want to survive. So for them, this is really important adaptive knowledge to have because it's when they're sick with malaria or whatever, it's a real impediment to their being able to function. So how do you measure this? Well, what the kind of items we had is uh, a small child in your family has HOMA, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with. Uh, she has a sore throat, headache, and fever. Uh, she has been sick for three days. Which of the following five Yad Nayan Luo, Luo herbal medicines can treat HOMA? Okay, so that question probably makes a lot of sense to you. Uh, and the options are Chamama, well, we're telling you this, we wouldn't tell you. know, Take the leaf and fiddle, sniff the medicine up the nose to sneeze out the illness. Or Kaladali, take the leaves, drink, and fiddle. Uh, Obuo, take the leaves and fiddle. Ogaka, take the roots, pound, and drink. Or Ahundo, take the leaves and fiddle. So that's an easy problem for them. Uh, and uh, so that's the sort of kind of thing that we're working with. So for us, the problem almost makes no sense, but for them, it's a very sensible problem to try to deal with. Uh, the answer, and so what did we find? 
uh, we found that the correlations between academic measures of fluid and crystallized intelligence and practical measures were negative. So here are the data, and the critical column would be the first column. And if you look at Deleuze vocabulary, which would be crystallized intelligence kind of measure, English vocabulary, another crystallized measure, total vocabulary, and Raven matrices, which would be a fluid measure, the correlations are all negative. Two of them are significant, but they're all in the same direction. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, that's a funny result if you believe in the theory of general intelligence, because the theory of in general, general intelligence argues that there's a positive manifold, that all correlations of ability measures should be positive, and at worst they're low, but you know you have a positive manifold in the table. Here you don't. So why would that be? You know, like why would you get it? Well, one thing you could say is, well, that's not an intelligence test, but in, in terms of adaptation in their culture, that's more important to know than academic knowledge, which, you know, how important is the academic knowledge to them? They're going to go to school for three or four years, they're going to drop out, and they're going to need to survive. So the academic knowledge there, it's not real important. Uh, the large majority of them will never use that stuff. They won't stay in school very long anyway. But why would you get a negative correlation? Well, uh, in, in these areas of rural Kenya where we're working, things work very differently from the way they do here, and that is the smart kids get apprenticeships and they drop out. And the idea is to get an apprenticeship so you can have a skill that you can turn into a job where you can make money, and the kids who aren't so seen as so able, no one wants to take them on as apprentices, so they stay in school. So they get more academic knowledge, but schooling is sort of seen as for losers. Uh, and uh, more schooling leads to less money. You would almost, I mean, you know, like an example in another country, not this one, would be people who go on to get a PhD who would get more schooling and less salary. Th that wouldn't happen here. But <laughs> the idea is that more schooling is not necessarily adaptive in terms of whatever the indices are that measure success in the society. So uh, what it's a, traditional education can be differentially valued around the world. Uh, other forms of education, in this case apprenticeships, may be more highly valued. Valuing depends on what's instrumental in the culture, and that can even be within the culture. You know, some people here might say, uh, wow, getting a PhD is really great, and uh, you know, I might get less money, but I get more life satisfaction and more fame and more uh, feeling that I'm making a difference. And other people in the same society might actually think, you know, you're actually going to school to make less money? I mean, that's, that's funny. I mean, take someone like, I don't know, my mother. Why in the <laughs> world would you get a PhD uh, and lose money? So it's, it, even here you can get some of these differences. Uh, students may be well, uh, and you know, and it's true. I mean, I, I have two older kids, Seth and Sarah. Uh, Seth dropped out of business school and he's incredibly wealthy and Sarah got a law degree and a PhD and now she's going to be an assistant professor. And, you know, she's never going to own her own plane. So it's, you know, I, even in my own family, schooling hurt. So students may be well educated according to their culture, but not by Western standards, and the same principles apply in Europe and the United States. Okay, so, all right, so that was something in Kenya. Well, how about something here? Um, and so the third point I want to make is that students may have substantial practical skills that go unrecognized in academic tests. So even here, our focus on statewide mastery tests and uh, uh, SAT and ACT and the SAT2 and so on uh, may undervalue certain kids and consistently lead to other kids actually being, in a sense, overvalued. What, what do I mean by that? Well, so let's talk about a study we did among Alaskan Yupik uh, Eskimos looking at academic and practical skills. So this was a study we did in southwest Alaska. Uh, so we're really talking about, you know, uh, areas where you can only get to them by plane. And in the winter, you can't even get to them at all. So that's, that's a typical village uh, in southwest Alaska with, with the Yupik Eskimos. And it's on, it's on the water. It's mostly a fishing kind of a culture. Uh, and in the winter, when the plane comes, you just get on, because most of the time the plane doesn't come. So it's really isolated. Uh, and so the question we're asking, the motivating question here is, what's the relation between academic and analytical 
and practical intelligence uh, in the context of the lives of rural Alaskan Yupik Native American Eskimos. So it's related to the kind of work we did in Kenya, but here we're asking about Eskimos, and as you'll see, the focus of the study is a little different. But you, it, it's saying you have to understand intelligence in terms of the ecology of the people you're looking at. So here's a problem from the test we gave them. Uh, when Eddie runs to collect the ptarmigan that he's just shot, he notices that its front pouch, its balloon, is full of ptarmigan food. This is a sign that there's a storm on the way, winter is almost over, it's hard to find food this season, it hasn't snowed in a long time. And so again, if you were to take this test, you might do slightly better than chance, but not a lot better. But for the kids, the Yupa kids, these are not particularly hard problems. The point being that what's hard kind of depends on the context in which you're growing up, and you may say, well, who cares about that stuff? But if you live there, you would care a lot about it, but you might not care so much about uh, you know, congruence problems on the SAT. So you're, you're in a different environment, and it's, it's no different right here. You know, if you're a physicist or a psychologist or an English professor or a student, you need different skills and different knowledge. Okay, so what did we find? Well, we found that urban students, urban being small cities in Alaska that were mostly white kids, outperform rural Yupik students on academic intelligence tests. Not a surprising finding. I mean, that's a very typical kind of finding. But rural Yupik students outperformed urban students on the Yupik practical intelligence test. And these are the data. So we used, again, uh, the Cattell, which would be a fluid intelligence measure, Mill Hill, which is a crystallized intelligence measure, uh, and then our test of practical intelligence. Uh, and this is rural boys, urban, uh, rural boys, urban boys, rural girls, or urban girls. It doesn't matter if you look at the boys or girls, the data are the same. That the urban kids do better on the academic test, the Yupa kids do better on the practical intelligence tests that are contextually designed. And you could again say, well, you know, the Mill Hill and the Cattell are better tests, but again, for whom? If you want to make a living, living in these Yupik villages, you better know the stuff that's relevant to adaptation in your environment, just as you're being an excellent, you know, a superb person in English literature or in theoretical physics might not help you get tenure in uh, human development and vice versa. So, so, that's, uh, so that's what we found, that the, the sort of optimum way to measure intelligence kind of depends on the context in which you need to use the intelligence. Uh, and, okay, so let's go on. So academic intelligence modestly predicted acad adaptive skills but not hunting skills in the urban and rural environments. So, it sort of depends on what you're trying to measure, what kinds of assessments you should use. Practical intelligence moderately predicted adaptive skills and moderately predicted hunting skills in the rural communities but not the urban communities. So if you wanted to predict hunting skills, then you would want to use the practical intelligence test. And you may say, well, I don't hunt, but if you live there, you either hunt or you're very hungry. So, you know, Again, it depends on the environment. I've, I've said to Karen many times that if I lived in a hunting culture, we'd all be dead. So we're, we're lucky. Okay, so implications for it. Students may have critical knowledge that's important for their adaptation that teachers don't have, and vice versa. And that's something really, you really have to take seriously. These Yupa kids can tell you how to go from one uh, village to another village that might be 100 miles away in the frozen tundra in the winter, and they'll get there. If their teachers, who view the kids as not very smart, uh, try to do the same task, they die. So who's smart? Well, the teachers don't have to do that task. The kids have to do that task. So the kids have this tremendous store of skills that's relevant to their environment that the teachers don't have, but the teachers, through their lenses, see the kids as not very bright, because to succeed in their textbooks, you don't need to do that kind of spatial navigation. Teachers may nevertheless view these students as slow or even stupid, yet the teachers would not be able adequately to, the, to adapt to the students' environments. Uh, tests are predictably valid as an interaction among persons, tasks, and, and situation. And really, try, you know, 
One of the things that struck me is I was in Caracas um, some years ago and uh, I was staying at a hotel and I, I like to walk so I took a walk and I got back to the hotel and I told the people at the hotel where I'd taken a walk and they said, are you crazy? You could have been killed. I mean, that's like super dangerous area to walk in. Well, it didn't look dangerous to me. I mean, it looked fine. And what I realized is anyone living there would know I was nuts to be walking there but I didn't have the knowledge and adaptive skills, so I might have been dead. Again, the ultimate test of non-adaptation. So you need to develop a different knowledge base and skills to survive in different kinds of places. And if you want to try what I mean, try living in Wyoming. Uh, it's, it's different in different places. Okay, so fourth is that practical intellectual skills may be better predictors of health than academic ones. You know, when I talk about another place, it may sound, well, we're better and they're worse. No, it's just they're different. And if you're going to live in the other place, then you have to have the skills to adapt there. So this is a study we did in Russia. Uh, and the question was, which is a better predictor of physical and mental health in adults, academic or practical intelligence? Uh, and the answer was that although both academic and practical intelligence predicted adult physical and mental health, practical intelligence predicted at a higher level. Uh, and you can see that here. This was, these were very large samples, so all of these correlations are significant, and the differences are significant. Uh, and what you can see is that the practical intelligence measures uh, were better predictors. Yeah. Uh, how do you define practical here? Uh, practical here was the Russian society changed. This was done at the cusp of the change in Russian society. So what we, when we measure practical intelligence, what we do is we'll go, and, and I was talking to someone about uh, a book I co-wrote called Practical Intelligence in Everyday Life. We go into the culture or the occupation or the society, and we ask people, what are the tasks that you face that are important for you uh, to adapt in your environment? And we base the questions on the tasks they give us. So when you see these practical tests, they're actually based on fairly extensive interviews with the people uh, who you're dealing with. So it, practical is different in different places, as you could see, say, between the Eskimos and the uh, Yupik, uh, the, the Eskimos and the um, kids in Kenya. Okay, so practical skills may be more important for good health practices than academic skills. Uh, we should not assume that conventional schooling is necessary for good health practices and students need to learn knowledge in practice as it applies to health or anything else. It, it's, it, or anything else, it's like you could take a driver ed course, uh, but you wouldn't want to drive with someone, say, in New York City who said, well, I got 100% on the written driver's test, uh, but I never have actually driven before. I mean, you know, you wouldn't want to start in New York City. You can have the book knowledge or you could teach a course on classroom management it doesn't mean you can manage a, manage a classroom. Or you could teach a course on sex ed and so on. Okay. Uh, and intelligence can actually, at least at an implicit theory level, mean different things in different cultures. So uh, in a study we did, it, this was a while ago in the early 80s, we, when we looked at people's implicit theories of intelligence, we got three factors, practical problem solving, verbal ability, and social competence. That was in the United States. But the interesting thing I thought at the time was that even in the United States, using kind of standard populations that you'd use in your studies, this was adults, it wasn't college students, really only one of those factors is measured by standard intelligence tests, which is verbal ability. Uh, in a study we did in Taiwan, uh, we found five factors, cognitive ability, which is more your standard stuff, interpersonal competence, intrapersonal competence, which is how you manage yourself, knowing when to show you're smart and knowing when not to show you're smart. So in Taiwan, again, there were factors that you wouldn't see on a standard test. Knowing when not to show you're smart is like when you're on a date, uh, when you're playing poker, uh, when you're trying to negotiate a business deal and you hope that they'll think you're a sucker so that they'll give you a better deal and then you trick them and so on. So there are some times when you want to show you're smart, there's sometimes you don't. But again, it goes well beyond SATs, ACTs, and IQ tests. And I should say the reason I put them together is that statistically they all measure the same thing. Uh, Doug Detterman and his colleagues did some studies where they actually did something ETS would never do, which is correlate the ACT, the SAT, IQ tests, 
and you find that the different tests correlate as highly with each other as different IQ tests correlate with each other. So the, although they have different names, they're all measuring basically general intelligence or G. Uh, in Kenya, we found four factors, Rieko, which is knowledge, ability, skills, which is closer, closest to what we measure intelligence tests, but includes knowledge and skills beyond school ones. Luaro, which is respect, Paro, which is initiative, Winjo, which is comprehension of the complexities of the problem situation. So no matter where you go, intelligence tests look kind of incomplete, at least in terms of people's implicit theories. Clear? Okay, so Western tests reflect a relatively small subset of even Western notions of what constitutes intelligence behavior. The tests may be quite inadequate in assessing intelligence because they don't look at some of these broader notions. And indigenous tests can help to assess people according to their own standards. And this is not to say that intelligence tests are terrible. That's not the message. It's that they're incomplete that they're a part of the story, they're not the whole story, and what I'll argue is it's scary that we put so much reliance on them. Okay, so in another study in San Jose, uh, the question we dealt with is teachers' evaluations of students is constrained by their conceptions of intelligence. What if it's the case, as I found with my own kids, that teachers have different conceptions of intelligence and that that affects kids' outcomes? For example, Almost all teachers thought Sarah was smart, and Sarah's the one who, you know, went to Yale and then Yale Law School and Harvard Graduate School. She's just a conventionally smart student, whereas Seth, my son, my adult son, is very practically oriented. And some teachers thought he was really smart, some thought he was a hopelessly, you know, hopeless basket case, because if he didn't see the practical implications of what he was learning, he just didn't care and didn't learn it. Uh, and so the idea is that teachers and even graduate school advisors in other places have different conceptions of what it means to have a smart student and so whether you're just as smart will depend on their implicit theory of what they mean by smart. For one it might be that you publish a lot, for another it's that you're a great teacher, for another it's you're in a lab 60 hours a week. You know it's different implicit theories. I'm not going to pursue that. Uh, so the question was, do students of a particular ethnic group do better in school if their parents' conception of intelligence matches that of the student's teachers? In other words, if your parents are socializing in a way that matches what teachers think is smart, if the parents and teachers have similar conceptions, does it help you do better in school? Not because you're smarter, but because there's a match in implicit theories, so teachers value what your parents happen to value. So the answer was yes. Anglo-American and Asian-American parents emphasize cognitive competence in their conceptions of intelligence. They really put a lot of emphasis on the cognitive side. Latino-American parents emphasize social competence, uh, but teachers emphasized cognitive competence. So the Latino emphasis on average, you know, you could say, well, social competence, after you get out of school, is more important than academic competence, but the teachers really emphasize the cognitive, which is what the white and Asian parents emphasized. So the teachers saw the white and Asian kids as smarter and just didn't value the skills that the Latino parents emphasized. Uh, teachers more valued the skills of the Anglo and Asian students than they valued the skills of the Latino students, even though they were simply developing different sets of skills. So teachers sometimes have limited views of what it means for a child to be intelligent. And it's not just teachers of elementary school. It can be teachers in college. It can be teachers at the graduate school level, postdoctoral level. Parents have their own views and socialize their students to be intelligent according to their own views. So students may be smart in the home and community, but not in the school because of a mismatch in what's valued. And teachers really need to broaden their conceptions of intelligence. Okay, so now can you apply this to teaching kids? So students learn mathematics better, I'm going to argue, if they're taught in a way that's contextually relevant. So we're back to the Yupik Eskimo. So we said, okay, uh, these kids have a different set of skills. The teachers don't think they're very smart. What if we teach them math in a way that actually capitalizes on their knowledge and intellectual strengths? So let's teach a Yupik kids uh, perimeter and area, but let's use fish racks. And let's compare their learning of these geometric concepts using fish racks to their learning using textbooks. 
when Alaskan Yupik kids were taught geometry tri triarchically, which means that there was not only an analytical emphasis, but a practical emphasis using the fish racks, they outperformed students who were taught the same common kind of concepts conventionally, regardless of the form of assessment used. So simply using materials that were familiar to them to teach the same concepts resulted in higher achievement than doing it in a more abstract analytical way with a textbook that didn't relate to the kinds of experiences they had in their lives. Uh, yes? Uh, we don't have that much time, but if you have a quick question. Yeah, just a quick question on this. Sure. So I, know, I know you've done the study, and I should probably be able to retrieve it. You know I've done the study. I'm sure you've I, as much as Wendy did that video, yeah. yeah there you go. Um, but if you just had two different tests that were both concrete, mm -hmm. or two different analytical tests, if you've got you know, more different examples of the same underlying concept, you have an opportunity for transfer. Right. For understanding. So is it really that, or is it really the additional practical in the end, you want the kids to understand it both ways. I was talking to someone earlier about the studies we used to do in syllogistic reasoning, and we, we found, like everybody else, that when you give emotionally laden concepts, it distorts their syllogistic reasoning. So you want the kids to have the cognitive competence, but you also want them to be able to apply it in their lives. But if my view is that if you're teaching stuff out of context, the risk also is that the kids will just never be able to use it in context, period. And so this, when we assess the kids, the assessments were the same for the textbooks as they were for the practice. So even on abstract assessments, they did better because they learned things in a way that's meaningful to them. Does that make sense? So it's using the same test. Okay, moving on. Using unfamiliar abstract curriculum materials may, for some students, affect their performance detrimentally. Teaching via materials that are familiar to students can help improve their performance, and such materials should be fully integrated into the curriculum. Okay, so I was interested in some of these concepts as they apply to us, you know, in more conventional uh, environments, and I started getting interested in this when I was a professor at Yale. Uh, and in the context of college admissions. My first job after, when I was in uh, undergraduate school, I worked part-time admissions. My first time was, my first job was as a special assistant to the Dean of Undergraduate Admissions at Yale, so I've always been interested in admissions. And I wonder, is, is it possible to assess in the U.S. in ways that increase prediction and reduce multicultural differences? In other words, can you simultaneously increase prediction of college success and reduce ethnic group differences? That's hard to do. Usually when you reduce ethnic group differences, you also reduce prediction. So could we do that? So uh, we, in the Rainbow Project, which was the last study I did before I left Yale, we had roughly 1,000 high school seniors and college freshmen from around the nation, ranging greatly in academic skills. So they were from all over the country. Uh, and that was a study we just, you know, we went to schools colleges and high schools all around the country and asked them to do some tasks. And the tasks were based on the theory of in successful intelligence as it existed at the time. Some were analytical tasks, some were creative tasks, some were practical tasks. And then, so we did that study, we got some data, and I'll describe them to you. Then, then after that I went to Tufts as Dean of Arts and Sciences, and we implemented Rainbow as kaleidoscope. So now we're not just doing a study, we're actually doing admissions at Tufts based on these ideas. The reason I went into administration was I really wanted to apply my ideas and show they worked. And the reason for that was when we got great results from the Rainbow Project, which is funded by the College Board, we got these great results that were published as the lead article in intelligence, they were carried by the media, and then the College Board stopped funding us. So I was really interested in, you know, they said you couldn't make it work if you upscale it. I said, well, okay, I'm going to upscale it. So we did. So we had roughly 30,000 high school seniors applying to Tufts University, optionally answering application questions. So that this was now actually on the Tufts application, and then we did the same thing at Oklahoma State via Panorama, except that the questions at Oklahoma State were adapted to a different kind of applicant population, because Oklahoma State and Tufts have really different applicant populations. But the idea was in all three studies, at Yale, at Tufts, and at Oklahoma State, now it's being done at Wyoming, can we change measures in a way that uses this idea of a broader measure of intelligence and actually make it work in the real world. 
Okay, so here's some examples. Uh, this is one from Rainbow. You see a picture and you have to caption it. Okay, so it's a cartoon. It's like a New Yorker deal. Uh, and a more creative response might be tie-dyed and a less creative response caught in the copier. So we have judges who use rubrics uh, so for creativity, that rate for novelty, quality, and task appropriateness. Uh, suppose some event in history had come out differently, how would life be different today? So this is one essay. If the Trojans had heeded Alcuin's advice and thrown Odysseus's wooden horse into the sea, uh, they would have defeated the Greeks at Troy. Aeneas then would never have had reason to flee the city, and he would never have ventured to Italy to foul Rome. So this is a real essay from a Tufts applicant. Uh, without Rome, neither the Roman Republic nor a Roman Empire would have existed. Concrete, the arch, plumbing, and the sauna might never have been invented. The modern implications of Rome never having existed are indeed drastic. Lacking even concrete floors, people would resort to sleeping in the mud, and without plumbing or saunas, they would be perpetually filthy and generally quite chilly. France could not have built the base of the Eiffel Tower without arches, so tourists would be unable to purchase miniature collectible towers in Parisian <laughs> convenience stores. So that was rated high on novelty, quality, and task appropriateness. It's a good creative essay. Here's another one. What if the ratification of the 19th Amendment did not pass and women were never given the right to vote? What would a life for women like me be like in the United States? For one thing, I probably would not be writing this essay if women were not given the right to vote. I probably would stop going to school after this year and it would be unlikely that I would receive a college education. Without suffrage, my career options would be limited if a career were a possibility at all. My accepted practices would be limited to staying home and taking care of the family. Rather than being equals, women would be subservient to men. I might not drive, I might not dress in the way in which I choose to, and I might not be able to live my life in the way that I can in the 21st century. Perfectly good essay. In terms of quality, it was rated as high as the first one, but it's less novel. Now think about it, the college, the SAT has a writing section, and if you were rating as writing, this rates as well as the first one does, maybe a little bit better. The rating was actually slightly higher, but it's not as novel. So that's to give you a sort of an example. The Kaleidoscope Project at Tufts in Panorama at Oklahoma State was not instead of ACTs or SATs, it was saying, are there other things we could measure so that we could find kids who could be successful here and in life, but you couldn't have told that from their SATs, ACTs, or high school grades. So it's not an instead of. Analytical intelligence is part of this theory. It's an addition to. Uh, and then we had other verbal tasks, both at Oklahoma State and at Tufts. Uh, design a scientific experiment on a problem of interest to you. Use a given set of words in a creative story so you give them really different words and then have to integrate them into a single story. Write a story based on one of the following titles. Like, so you would give them a dozen titles like The End of MTV or Confessions of a Middle School Bully or The Mysterious Lab. So you give them a choice. Um, we, so in the uh, Rainbow Study, and we also had practical and analytical and a tough wisdom-based items, but I don't have time to give lots of items today. So in the Rainbow Study, we had three factors. They were supposed to be creative, practical, and analytical. They weren't. The, we got two out of three right. We got a creative performance factor. We got a practical performance factor, but the second factor was anything that was multiple choice. So whether we try to measure creative abilities, practical abilities, analytical abilities by multiple choice, it all factored together. So one of the reasons that some creativity and practical tests don't work is if you go to sort of a standard kind of conventional psychometric format, the tests tend to clump together. And they, even though they don't look like they're measuring G, they did. That's what we found. So what we found is that in terms of predicting GPA, if you add our creative measures to SAT verbal and SAT math, you got a, this is predicting first year GPA, you got a pretty big increment, almost double. Uh, and actually, if, you, I, if I showed you all the graphs, again, I try to shorten this, but analytic, our analytical measures didn't add anything. Our creative and practical did. We basically doubled prediction of performance, first year performance. Uh, if you look at ethnic group differences, SAT and ACT showed pretty large differences. This is comparing whites and Asians to all other minorities. So this is uh, eta squared and uh, omega squared, I'm sorry, omega squared. 
you get a large effect for SAT and ACT, you get a smaller effect for M measures. And if you look at it by ethnic group, what you find, and we have those data, is that different ethnic groups show different patterns. So it really depends on which ethnic group. But if you only use analytical measures, the results are totally predictable. Uh, Asians do best on the math section. Uh, you know, whites generally do better on verbal and analytical tests. Uh, the African American and Latino groups and American Indian groups didn't do as well, but American Indian groups actually did better on creative oral storytelling. So it depended on which measure which group did better. Okay, so in Kaleidoscope at Tufts, we found, we found no ethnic group differences. In Rainbow, we reduced ethnic group differences. In Kaleidoscope, we essentially eliminated them. Uh, we increased prediction of freshman GPA holding constant SAT in high school grades. We had, from air measures, significant prediction of extracurricular active citizenship and leadership involvement and increased applicant satisfaction. So, it, it, and Tufts is still using uh, Kaleidoscope even though I'm gone. Uh, at Oklahoma State, I don't have formal data because I left before the formal data were collected, but Oklahoma State is continuing to use Panorama because it was, give, it was enabling Oklahoma, Oklahoma State had admitted people before strictly on the basis of ACT and high school grades. And the, you know, my view was, well, if we're trying to accept kids who will be active citizens and ethical leaders, you're not going to find that out from the ACT and grades. So they're continuing to use Panorama. Uh, so how did schooling get where it is? What I've argued, and I know I'm out of time, so I'll be really quick is that basically, you know, we're, we sort of have an entrenched testing system as well as instructional system. Uh, and it's a closed system. E essentially what we've done is we used to use sort of social class to decide who gets into elite schools like this one. Then we switched to tests, but the tests are very highly correlated with socioeconomic status. So now we have a meritocracy, but it's more a difference in label than it is in what we actually do. But what it does is it creates self-fulfilling prophecies. So the example I gave to someone this morning is if you think tests work, they will. Here's why. I, I, the example I gave is height. If you decide to admit students to Cornell by height, so you only admit tall students. And you know Harvard, you have to be really tall. And Squeedunk, you don't have to be that tall. But it's all done by height. And then 30 years later, you do a Herrnstein, Murray, or Jensen, or Gottfriedson type of study correlating uh, height with success in life, you will find that height predicts success in life because you created the correlation by your funneling processes. So you gave more opportunities to people who test well, and then you find out that when you give them more opportunities, they do better. So we have to, when we look at correlations, we have to ask, did we discover the correlation, or to some extent, did we create it? So in conclusion, individuals are better recognized for and are better able to develop and make use of their talents to get smart if we take cultural, ecological context into account. Whether it's in Kenya or France or Germany or here, it's, it's the same. Schools can teach and assess students better if they take into account these ecological contexts and society better utilizes rather than waste the talents of its members. The last thing I wanted to mention uh, is uh, you, you might wonder, well, where does all this go? So I'm still interested in developing some of these measures more of broader abilities. And I have a model of ethical reasoning that I'd like to test. But the thing I'm most interested in now is uh, what I referred to this morning in a conversation is murky environments. So I have a quote here from Alice in Wonderland. Uh, but I don't want to go among mad people, Alice remarked. Oh, you can't help that, said the cat. We're all mad here. I'm mad. You're mad. Uh, how do you know I'm mad? Uh, said Alice, well, you must be, said the cat, or you wouldn't have come here. Uh, and what I mean by murky environments is usually we assume, so in my first phase of research, you might say, I said, let's expand the measures of abilities we use. But what I've come to realize is that it's not just about expanding the me measures of abilities, it's about better understanding the environments in which people function. Uh, the example I gave last night at dinner uh, in another context was, is it good to be creative? Well, is there anyone here who thinks it's bad to be creative? Well, it's good to be creative, but one of the things you learn when you write grant proposals is if they're too creative, they don't get funded. 
Uh, and if you write an article, if it's too creative, it doesn't get funded. Uh, is it good to be ethical? Yeah. What you begin to realize is that any trait you think is good, it kind of depends on where you are. Uh, you might think it's good to be smart. Well, you go, on, you go out with someone and they never call you again because oh, who wants to go out with an egghead like that? So uh, what I've come to realize is that you really need better to understand the ecology uh, in which you're operating, the murkiness of the environment, because what it, what's good is not always just good. Sometimes what you would consider good in a given environment could be bad. You know, if you look at the NIH rating system, you know, all right, so they're giving these numerical ratings. Well, that means that, you know, given that your selection ratio now is about 10% or less, if even one reviewer doesn't like you, you're dead, right? If one referee thinks you stink, you're out. Well, there, and there's a ceiling, a ceiling effect for the ones who think you're good. You know, they can only give so high a rating. So one person giving you a low rating can kill you. Well, if you do a really creative grant proposal, somebody's not going to like it. You know, creative people are people who defy the crowd. So, you know, you do creative work, you're going to step on some toes. So that's going to kill you with that one person. That's the end of your grant proposal. So what I'm really interested in now is this idea of murky environments and understanding things like, are there environments in which skills that we usually consider to be good aren't so good, including academic environments, but even more so in other environments. Uh, what factors contribute to the murkiness of the environment? What different kinds of murkiness are there? There are storms where, uh, you know, all of what was good stops being good, like when the Soviet Union ended or when certain presidents came into office. So this concept of murkiness of environments, I think, is relevant to us all, not just to people in other kinds of environments, and that you need to understand the sources of murkiness, what you do about murkiness when you decide to get out of it in order better to understand how you can optimize your life outcome.